Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today's guest is Andrew Jernigan. He's the CEO of Insured Nomads, one of the world's leading providers of health insurance for digital nomads. Andrew, how's it going? Uh, it's going well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, Vance, and, and all the loyal listeners of that Latin life. Absolutely. And so in this episode, we'll probably be talking a lot about health insurance for digital nomads, but I think uh, this episode might be more interesting than some of the other interviews you've given because you do have a background in Latin America and specifically in Brazil. So I thought, Andrew, maybe to kick us off, you could just tell us a little bit about your background, uh, your your story as a digital nomad or, or traveler, which I know you have some experience with, and uh, how, how everything kind of came about. Well, thanks. I, yeah, that, well, that takes me back in time. And, and this morning, I uh, actually had a friend ask me, he said, if you could move back to South America, would you? I said, oh, absolutely, and, and probably will. Uh, so it's, this is a, a nice walk down memory lane as I go through the many trips in and out of Brazil and, and Argentina, and I can't wait for other locations in the years ahead. Uh, I, yes, I was struck I, with love um, for a Brazilian, and she took my heart away, but she had it in her mind that she was going to practice medicine in an African country. So I knew that my time for my first move to Brazil was not going to really last very long. And it was, I was back in the day, it was in 99 and 2000 when I left my corporate job in the U S and went on Elance, which is now known as Upwork. Mm -hmm. They bought that domain name for kind of freelancers. Mm -hmm. And there I was uh, working from my laptop. I saw the twin towers fall from you know, from my dial-up connection as I was doing freelance work, design agency and things at that time, some 20 plus years ago. Wow. So walk us through a little bit. Uh, you met a, a Brazilian and then did you move together to Africa? Uh, it took a few moves in between here and there to get debt free. And so we moved from Brazil to the U.S., Lived in several different states in the U.S. over the next couple of years. Got got to where we we're financially strong enough to to move to Ghana, West Africa. Spent a better part of about four years there. Um, many trips during our time there, for, you know, to Chiang Mai and Dubai, Liverpool, you name it, mm -hmm. different places during our four years in Ghana. But it was, you know. Prior to, to that, it was a season in Brazil. That's where we actually got married and then uh, had our first kid in the U.S. Second kid three months before we moved to Ghana. So she was tiny. And, uh, you know, there's so many flavors of nomads now. Back in 95, 96, when I was in Amsterdam and the word digital nomad was first used, that was when I wrote my journal that there's no country I don't want to visit. And I wanted to marry someone from a country other than my own. And, you know, I've got many places I've yet to go, but I found that life partner that has that sense of adventure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've done it. I had the lifestyle when I was single and then married and now, you know, raising three kids all around the world. It's been very gratifying, challenging. We've learned from a lot of mistakes and many successes too along the way. Yeah, and I think you mentioned uh, offline that your three kids are dual citizens, so they're American Brazilian. Yes, that is correct, and uh, of course, one of them could get his uh, passport for Ghana if he, since he was born there. But uh, yeah, they have the desire to to get another passport, even get that third passport, <laughs> and uh, it's it's fun watching as they grow up that we've tried just about every form of schooling when we first started out we thought you know i'm i'm certainly not an educator my wife wasn't and knew that she'd be working full time as a doctor and once we got to the in the village life in ghana and we took it so ended up having a teacher move 
to live with us and travel with us. And then from there, it, you know, we've, we've tried so many different forms of schooling from world school to, you know, the teacher going around different countries with us and the local school, international school, uh, Italian school, you name it. It's, there've been so many different things we've tried, but, um, it's, it's a journey once you, and the life sure shifts when you get married and they have career opportunities that take them across to another place. You know, my, yeah, this it's exhilarating, but yet it's, it's challenging. The more you bring into this lifestyle, Mm -hmm. keeping it simple is so crucial. We, you know, we're, you know, we're recording this and kind of near Christmas, but I had a family member ask me, oh, you have that Christmas village that you used to keep on the mantle, right? It's like, oh, no, we gave that away some some move ago. We gave that to somebody. Because we just give stuff away nonstop because you can't take it with you. Right. And keeping a simple life is so crucial if if you're wanting to live this kind of nomadic mobile lifestyle. It's not the easiest thing because friendships – family, um, your kids, friends, et cetera, may not be moving all the time like we are. Yeah. There's, there's so much to think about. You were really sort of a, a pioneering expat or digital nomad, um, who got started with this some 20 years ago. Uh, we were talking about schooling. I think that's a topic in and of itself. Uh, I was wondering, I guess you're, you're raising your kids to be bilingual. Ah, uh, yes, they are by, um, well, more than that, but yeah, they're, um, they have other languages that they've picked up along the way. So that's, I think it's crucial, even if it's a, a thing of, you know, we always criticize learning a, a language in high school or something, but it's easy to activate once you get going, even though you may not have practiced that language that you learned in school. Yeah. And uh, it must be interesting being back in the states, going from Brazil or Ghana or all the all the places you've been, and and to go back to the northeastern United States. Does it does it feel? Do you are you at the point where you feel culture shock in your own country? Oh, absolutely! Reverse culture shock is is so hard, and it, I I still find it a challenge. Uh, someone recently gave me a gift card to to a big bookstore here. And I went the other day, it's like, whoa, all the selection, no way, not, not doing it left with, you know, left with just a cookie. And it's like, I'll come back and use my gift card another time. But, you know, just life in different places, making French toast or pancakes and thinking, okay, now to find pan- uh, syrup. Mm-hmm. Syrup is not the easiest thing to find in many cultures. And because it's just far. And especially if you want in maple syrup versus, just a, a blah table syrup. But here you go to the grocery store and you have 53 different kinds. It may just be different sizes, but you know, four different sizes of one brand. <laughs> so it's, it is challenging to say the least with all the variety that, that can be found of some things, but then it's the other thing of, oh, I so miss this curry and you can't find it. Would you because would you uh, be able to give us a rundown of like where you've lived for how long, at least just at a high level, like how many years in Brazil, how many in Africa? Oh my, let's see. I I may miss a few here and there, but uh, my first first time to go outside the U.S. was to the Netherlands in Europe. I spent a better part of a year in Amsterdam. Loved it. It was service work during university years, mm-hmm. and. Um, just fell in love with the Dutch and uh, with the people there and have been back many times Uh, that led to shorter trips in and out of different European countries and, and the the UK Uh, went back, married with two kids uh, lived in the UK for a season while my wife got another postgraduate degree and um, in and out of South Africa and Mozambique at different times Thailand and Dubai for short trips. And let's see, Brazil. I've lived in Rio twice. Uh, Once closer to Copacabana and then another time suburban life 
very close to the beach also, but way outside the, the chaos of the big city. And then in the city of Belo Horizonte, third largest city in Brazil, about five or six million people. And mm -hmm. I have lived there four times now, a couple of years each time. Okay. Is your wife Mine uh, Mineta? She is. She is from Belo Horizonte. That's awesome. I, I hear that's the best accent in uh, Brazilian Portuguese, like the, the most beloved. Yeah, and the best food, <laughs> for sure. That's awesome. And um, yeah, and I think you mentioned briefly that there's different types of nomads, and you're certainly a particular type of nomad. And I think in this episode, we'll, we'll maybe address what those different types are and then how maybe insurance solutions uh, might affect people differently. And uh, also just talk about, you know, I think insurance solutions could be different for whether you're single or wh whether you're a family traveling. Right. So I think those would be some good things to cover. Yeah. You know, insurance is, is not cookie cutter for everyone because some people may be financially independent to where they don't have to transfer that risk over to an insurance company. It's, it's not uncommon to run into some a nomad or someone that's, you know, location independent and saying, you know, if something happens, they've got the 25 thousand reserve and they're willing to get treated in that whatever country they're in where healthcare is low. And that's wonderful, especially if you're free enough to say, you know, if there was a major illness that suddenly came on or, you know, broken neck from a hike or from a car accident and you're willing to stay in that country for years for care, that's really great. I'm kind of in that place just because of my Brazilian tie. I, I would trust their health care in a heartbeat. And the longer you're in one particular location, oftentimes you can get local health insurance. Mm -hmm. And especially if you end up working for a local company at, or part-time with a local company, they can get local health insurance for you. It's going to save you a fortune, but it's only going to cover you there. So if you are traveling, it's tough to get insurance for your home country when you're visiting. Because travel insurance is meant for when you're traveling outside your home country on trips mm -hmm. generally, so short term. And um, unfortunately, a lot of marketing has been done for uh, digital nomads saying, okay, you're starting this lifestyle by travel insurance. When it's a product design for short generations ago for a business trip or a vacation knowing that you're coming back to your home country where you have health care provided, whether it's through a, a universal health care program like Canada, Israel, France, Brazil, you know, European countries have a universal health care so that if there's a diagnosis, you're going to get cared for eventually. Of course, in many of those countries, even that have universal health care, folks are buying comprehensive health insurance uh, to, so that there's no waiting list if something major happens. That's really what a large percentage of nomads are, are moving toward now is a comprehensive health insurance because they're going to be in this lifestyle for a couple of years or more. Mm -hmm. And that way an unexpected birth of a child could be covered a, uh, an illness or a catastrophic in injury, even if it's a major deductible or excess that's carried just to lower the premium and thinking, okay, if there's a major illness, then I've got something to, you know, cover those costs. But so travel medical insurance is the very basic that, that folks look at first. Travel insurance, when you don't have that word travel medical, it's generally covering cancellation of flights and cruise line. Um, right. The, the money you paid for that cruise, things like that. And that's usually not what, what nomads are looking at. It's a thing of, you know, if I have to change hotels, who cares? If I have to change apartments, I'm not going to get the money back. So travel medical for somebody who's going to be trying it, trying this out for a couple of months, even nine months is probably going to be adequate. But then health insurance is the alternative, which is a 12 month commitment mm -hmm. And annually renewable, so that if anything happens during that 12 months, it's renewed and those claims roll over. 
those conditions roll over are being treated. Now, we face the bad part about that is that pre-existing conditions are usually not covered by any of these type plans, travel insurance or health insurance, maybe an acute reoccurrence, but that affects a lot of people, whether it's, you know, someone who's been diagnosed with a mental illness, uh, something they need treatment for, that may be excluded from a policy just because the cost of treatment for it in um, Indonesia or Malaysia or, you know, Paris, if there were, was a complication, would be more than the cost of the policy itself. So at times there can be exclusions. Myself, for instance, I had heart attack and bypass surgery when I was in and out of Mozambique. Jeez. And um, sure, it's $110,000 surgery. Insurance covered all but 5000 because that was my deductible chosen at the time. And that's it's one of those things. I'm healthy as a 28-year-old now, doctors tell me. So it's great. But a lot of times insurance may look at that history and say, ah, we'll give you a policy, but we're going to exclude anything cardiac. Just because they know you're not paying them $100,000 a year for insurance. So there's a risk they're going to lose all their money. So when medical history is completed, you know that you're getting a comprehensive policy. Now, there's a flip side to that. Travel insurance, you can get adventure sports like paragliding and (laughs) uh, other things added to it. Comprehensive health insurance, you can't add that because that's usually a sporadic thing that you're doing. So if you're going to jump out of an airplane, you'd want to get a, you know, just a week long travel insurance policy and uh, with adventure sports added like our our policy yeah, has adventure sports so many, and i think there's so many scenarios um right? if you if you had to just surmise in a sentence or two the role that insured nomads plays in the market and what you guys are bringing to the market that didn't previously exist a couple of years ago what would you say oh wow that's that's a fabulous question because we didn't come into the market just to provide another one of the same thing with a prettier cover. We don't need more of the same. And our industry has been quite backwards for a long time. You know, it's, it's sad when I go to a conference and some vendor is telling me, yes, use our technology because people can fax it and you get it by email and things. It's like, oh yeah, insurance still works on a fax machine. And, and it's a packet in the mail or a PDF of fine print. So to shift that, it's, it's the simple things. Like if you buy a policy, you're going to get an email with a PDF that you sure don't want to read because it's so long. And logically so, because a lot of it's included. But if you're in a hospital bed four months later thinking, okay, 800 emails ago is this insurance. Can I remember what company I bought it from? I certainly don't know what number to call. So the easy thing of making it where it's in your it's in your Apple wallet, your Google wallet, a digital card with your policy number, contact information for us. And that's just not done these days. Still, strangely enough, you can get your boarding pass, you can get your loyalty program cards in your Apple wallet, but to get your your global insurance card there hasn't been done. Secondly, though, is to have an in-app experience for all these benefits and even a, an instant response button where you hit that and it's ringing a phone to our global assistance center. And for security, natural disaster, you know, safety aspects, we may not wait for you to hit that button. We may be calling you saying, hey, this happened near you. Can we relocate you? Can we change hotels? Because you're too close to where that incident happened. And that's all covered also, aside from our insurance in a membership that we offer. So an in-app experience really doesn't exist in this in this space still. But within that, giving airport lounge access and unlimited mental health sessions that's key. Wait, well, you get you because get airport lounge access with insured nomads? You do. 
So our health insurance, it comes for unlimited st- access. To which uh, which network? For our, uh, we tap into for our health insurance. We tap into the Priority Pass network. Priority Pass, okay. Right, and for the travel insurance, it's for registered delayed flights, and it'll get you and up to three traveling companions in a lounge, and that's through Instapass, which is a a very similar network. It's it's tapped into Lounge Buddy, which is actually owned by the same people as Priority Pass. Okay. So I have priority um, pass, so I'm familiar with it. Nice. And um, so a lot of people don't don't utilize their insurance and they think, okay, why? Why am I gonna do this? I never get sick, I never get injured. But we could say the same thing about you know, not insuring our house. It's just not logical though. We've got to care for our bodies just as much. So the changes we're we're doing with the travel technology to where there's GPS tracking, easy to turn on and off. You can keep it off, but if you hit that instant response button, it's turning, turning itself on so that we can dispatch assistance if needed. But it's still a reimbursement based industry when it comes to global insurance, unless you're actually admitted to a hospital long enough for wires to, uh, to be sent, which, means you're admitted for about a week in a hospital. Then oftentimes it's still reimbursement and people don't have the money for that many times, or they don't want to use their credit card to max it out for some hospital bill to get reimbursed by insurance. And so, so far we've deployed this in our global health plans and which is a MasterCard, insured nomads MasterCard, where we can drop funds on it and you can pay at the clinic or hotel or I mean, the hospital or our clinic or reimbursement right then onto that card. And we are developing that into new phases this next year so that we can do it within our uh, personal belongings or your, our device plan and for our travel insurance. So this, those the fintech components there that we're introducing is totally unheard of in the industry. There's a travel insurance product that has it, but you have to, you know, you have to be Israeli or I think Greek to buy that product. This on a global scale with our health insurance is something totally new, but to include mental health sessions, and that's in languages all over the world. It's not just in English, but mm-hmm. you know, French, Spanish, Hindi, Arabic, lots of different languages. And these are folks who have lived the cross border lifestyle that are the counselors. It's not life coaches. It's not, um, you know, this is, therapist right so you guys and have some something you have some think, like thoughtful perks basically that appeal to the digital nomad market in addition to the core health insurance so uh right we we kind of talked a bit about um just the 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 place in the market that you're filling that uh wasn't currently being addressed could you just give us an overview of insured nomads briefly as well just so all the listeners are are familiar with the company maybe um when it was founded how big it is what maybe uh product lines you guys have uh ho- however you want to describe insured nomads as a company well thank you we're we see ourselves as a technology company but we're humanizing the digital experience we're not working to digital digitalize the human you know the other way around it's sure we're working from our apps on our phones all the time but we're we're working to humanize that and so we started in 2019 and uh we're excited for 2023 because of so much new coming out we're a pre-pandemic we're a fully remote uh globally distributed team uh ranging from uh, Spain, the UK, Philippines, Bangkok, South Africa, Brazil, US. I may be missing a few countries where we have folks, but so we started in 2019. We're venture backed, and uh, our policies are uh, the really they are backed by A rated capacity providers all around the world. So in different regulated regions, we've partnered with different underwriters to build out our product Mm -hmm. and then making sure that we can pair the technology that's needed to bring it up to this generation. 
that's the key. It's not just taking an existing product and, and putting a different um, presentation to it, but it's building out things that are better than what's out there, easier to use. And so we first launched with travel insurance because many people are just trying this lifestyle out, you know, going for a month, three months, and that's adequate. Uh, maybe that their company has said you can work from anywhere and they said, fine, I'll, I'll go work from Europe for the next bit. Uh, the second we came out with was health insurance focused on the global citizen. Uh, in 2023, this will be also for, for locals in their home area. So if you're a multinational uh, or a distributed team, it'll include those that are cross border, but also those who are in their working in their home country in many of the areas. So, um, and the next product we have is called My Stuff, which is covering the laptop, the earbuds, microphone, the gadgets, the stuff mm -hmm. that help us stay alive. Because if you spill a glass of water on that MacBook Pro, it's kind of disabling your income source. Mm -hmm. So being able to cover that, your phone and uh, other key pieces is just crucial. Your espresso machine, et cetera. There, there are many things besides just your your work tools that can be covered with that plan. We're really excited about that one. And you, you know what's interesting about your corporate structure as like a, a venture-backed company is I noticed uh, one of your biggest competitors was actually a um, like a subsidiary of a global insurance company, right? And so... Uh, I guess different competitors or different companies in this space uh, have different, uh, you know, different backings and, and so forth. And that might lead to different incentives. I was just curious. Your it thoughts on it that. certainly does. Yeah. Many times the, the companies behind travel insurance, it's just one of many lines or with expat plans, which with time they've been referred to as expat plans. That mm -hmm. term has got to change as we look at the different types of, of people in the space. But yeah, it's, it's just a, usually it's not even bringing 10% of their revenue in. So it's not, not an area where they focus for innovation and for change. It's just the same policy, a PDF or packet in the mail, and you're hoping for the best. But being built by folks who've been in this industry for years and have lived and worked in this lifestyle, it's we see the need to to catch up really and so what term would be the best is it nomad insurance is it expat insurance is there a different term that would better encapsulate all the different types of sort of participants in global mobility I tend to think of it as health insurance and travel insurance in that sense because health insurance kind of just dis greatly distinguishes it than, than travel. Okay. Travel, think of it as a, a vacation or a quick trip, you know, less than a year. Right, right, right. But do you think Beyond about... Beyond that, though, I would go into health. Yeah. Sorry, you're, were you thinking expat versus nomad? Yeah, so let's just say, so let's just say we're talking about health insurance. Do, does it mm -hmm. make sense to call it digital nomad health insurance or expat health insurance? And I guess uh, a related question is like, are there rules around how often you have to travel or not travel? You know what I mean? Like, can can you spend more than six months a year in a given country or would that void the insurance? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you, you can't, generally can't have, um, I'll just refer to it as expat health insurance. Mm-hmm or the cross-border independent um, medical insurance, mm -hmm. you are not going to have that if you're going to be in your home passport country right? more than six months during the right, year. Right, right. So, I, yeah, I think I heard now, – is it six months, though? I, I thought it was like 30 days. Yeah, it, it varies per country, but uh, you – you wouldn't want to go over the six month mark. Okay. Cause I know, I think for Americans it's a little bit different and maybe we could talk about what's different for Americans. But, uh, before we get to that, so let's just say you're Canadian, European, UK, Australia, um, mm -hmm. uh, how, how, and so let's just say someone from these markets, 
uh, let's just say a Canadian gets uh, insured nomads health insurance, and let's say they they probably want to spend most of the year in Mexico. Maybe they're going to other spots as well. How much time are are they covered in Canada? How much time can they spend in Canada? How much time can they spend in Mexico? Can they spend more than six months in Mexico, more than six months in Canada? Yes. Um, so they can spend more than six months in Mexico for the coverage mm -hmm. if that's in the region that they're, they're choosing. Now, the Canadian may choose to exclude Canada and only choose the places he'll be. Okay, so you have to choose ahead so of So that's an option. Bit. You can choose... When you're applying and people say, okay, look, I know that for the next 12 months, I'm only going to be in Southeast Asia and Latin and South America. So they may choose to only have those regions. Others may say, hey, I'm going to be in Portugal the next 12 months. So forget the rest of the world. That's what I'm going to choose. But uh, generally traveling back to your home country, you would count it as, you know, under six months. Okay. That's pretty reasonable. And, um, yeah, for the snowbird, Canadian snowbirds that are often, you know, trying to hit that six month mark, they still would get that global health insurance to because it's going to cover them even when they're back home in Canada. Uh, that's yeah, that's, that's a much cool. more expensive plan, but it's going to cover the knee surgery if it if something major happened and it's, you know there's a fall and now there's going to be a surgery, you're not going to be stuck on a wait list. You can go to the hospital if you're choosing. And so is it, do you, are you typically choosing on a per country or per region basis, or is it possible just to get like international coverage sort of blank? Yeah, you can certainly get worldwide coverage, yeah. but there, there are different countries. Of course, the world is aware of how expensive healthcare is in the U S so excluding the U S oftentimes, if you exclude say Malaysia, your prices are going to go down a lot as well. There, there a few countries that, you know, if you can choose a region that exclude those countries, then your annual premium is going to go down. Uh, there's, there's another factor, though, to consider, and that's the excess. The Brits, the Euros would, uh, Euro, Europeans would express it as an excess. Americans and, and a few other countries would say deductible. Okay. And so if you're willing to have, a, you know, many places, they think a zero deductible. That way, if they're not responsible for anything before insurance starts paying for it, or we'll start reimbursing in full. But there are other cultures where it's no, I'll take five thousand on for myself, and then after that five thousand, insurance will pay. So that lowers the price you pay significantly on travel insurance. You'll see them with a two hundred fifty dollars deductible. That's one. It's so that insurance company doesn't have to pay out nonstop. Because the majority of claims are going to be less than that. If you break your arm in in Kenya or in Cape Town, in Rio or etc. in Thailand, you're not going to be paying more than a hundred bucks probably. And it's and a basic place to put it in a cast. So the deductible keeps the insurance company from having to have expenses immediately, and it lowers your payment to the insurance. Mm -hmm. So for global health, cross-border health, expat, digital nomad, comprehensive health insurance, people choose a $500 deductible all the way to a 5000 just to figure out, okay, what can I afford? What am I willing to take on as my own risk? Yeah, definitely makes sense. So I think maybe a lot of people listening to this, um, they are digital nomads. Uh, they've they've spent multiple months abroad at, at different periods of time and they were just maybe too lazy to get health insurance they didn't know that this digital nomad insurance exists and uh hopefully this podcast is kind of jogging people's memory or inspiring them to, to finally get this area of their life handled uh what are the steps that uh people should take to um uh, start thinking about this and take action on it. You know, I would, it's a great time of, of year to really be thinking about this and weighing, you know, is, is that a good financial decision? And I think if you're, 
if you're in this lifestyle, you should have either travel insurance or health insurance. And with travel insurance, it's a five to 10 minute purchase. You just put in where you're going. It usually covers you worldwide. It just gives a framework there to say, okay, yep, you're going to Argentina. You're going to Colombia. Cool. Choose worldwide, excluding USA, and your price is going to go down. Choose a you know, $500 deductible. is reasonable usually for most people. Lowers the price for you. And your chance of having to use it is usually low. So you paid a little bit less by having a higher deductible. Some people say, okay, I'll take the first thousand on travel insurance. Mm -hmm. Then when you're looking at health insurance, it takes a bit more than 10 minutes because you're going to give your health history. Mm. And if you're answering no to every health question, like, no, you've never, you know, haven't broken a bone. You haven't done this. You haven't done that. And, or yes, but it was 10 years ago. You're going to be approved at the quoted price, but it is reviewed by a medical underwriting team. And so the process could take a week after that application. But if you answer it with, yes, but I'm taking this medicine for diabetes and I'm taking this one for that, they may come back and say, okay, the price is going to be higher and we're going to have to exclude this condition. Uh, there's The cool thing, too, is that if you're doing this with a team and you have multiple people, uh, you can often get a, you know, up to a ten percent discount just because you have three different people oh, cool. working for the same company, and the more people you add to that team, the less they are concerned about medical underwriting. And so, if there's a team member that has a, you know, a few other issues, it's usually worked out in the group scenario. Yeah, the group stuff's cool. So, um, yeah, I, I have a couple. I have a couple questions. So, travel insurance. My understanding is if you have a pretty high-end credit card, at least for Americans or Canadians, like let's say you have Chase Sapphire Reserve, that covers a lot of the health insurance stuff, right? Like flight cancellations and um, uh, some of that stuff, right? What what would a digital nomad insurance, travel insurance cover on top of those credit cards? Uh, interesting. Um yeah, these the cards are really narrowing the benefits they're offering these days. And so I had a, a dear friend of mine the other day that said, look, I'm going to, I never buy it because I've got it. I've got travel insurance on my credit card. Well, he went to his card and realized that it covered cancellations, trip interruptions, lost luggage, right. baggage delay, right. things like that. But it doesn't cover anything for medical. Right. And so that's the Chase Sapphire in, in that example. Chase Sapphire has all kind of great benefits for trip interruption and cancellation if you use that card to purchase it. But medical, so if you you know break your arm out hiking or something, isn't covered. Right. And um, there are, it does cover if it's because you're on a flight that crashed, then there's some things there with a common carrier, they call it. Uh, so, you know, if you broke your arm because a flight crashed, that would be covered. So credit cards, it's one of those things you need to check to see what it's going to cover. So the credit cards and might actually have you, say, sorry, but the, so the credit cards might actually kind of have you covered from the travel insurance perspective. Cause I was wondering what, say a digital what say a uh, insured nomads travel insurance might have that a credit card might not have let's let's put aside the healthcare stuff for a second but let's just say the travel mm -hmm. insurance is there something that we're not thinking about that our credit cards aren't handling obviously people who don't have access to these high-end credit cards they're going to need insured nomads either way but people who do have these high-end credit cards um what 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 do you guys have that uh, potentially those cars don't have that we're not thinking about? Okay, so one is the medical maximum. Credit card benefits, if they cover medical, uh, would be limited usually to fifty thousand. And if you're in a a wealthy area, if you go to a great hospital, something major happens, 
you're going to hit over 50,000. There's a different entrance for foreigners. There's different billing. Um, you've seen it living the nomad lifestyle. A cup of coffee could be one price for you. And if it's different price and a different cup for a local. So it's, you know, they're getting the paper cup and you're getting the porcelain. No, cup. it's true. Like, Same like thing in, Mex- in, in Mexico, a healthcare or a hospital will, will charge more to foreigners for sure. Even a, pri- yeah. a private hospital. So that's one of the biggest things is the amount of the benefit okay. on a credit card. And, you know, I saw one family, their 14 year old got sick and they had health insurance. They paid, I think, $6,000 a year for their health insurance this type of comprehensive health insurance we've been talking about. And the claim ended up 88,000 bucks. They ended up in, in a hospital in Johannesburg intensive care for five weeks. And that included the, the air evac from a neighboring country into South Africa. None of that medical evac wouldn't have been covered, which it is covered in the, in health insurance, it wouldn't have been covered with a credit card. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, I, I, I transport I, not obviously covered. because that's like healthcare stuff. But I was wondering, yeah. I was wondering more about like I don't know, like Airbnb cancellations or no other like trav- Never travel, never going to be covered stuff. Yeah, cancellation fees for Airbnb things like that wouldn't generally wouldn't be covered. If they are, also, it's probably going to be onto your card, and then you fight it out to get reimbursed. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a long process, you know, okay. with delayed luggage, it may be 50 bucks, but you may have to wait th- for three months to get that 50 du- 50 bucks per piece of lost luggage. Okay. All right. So let's put travel insurance aside. Um, uh, and maybe let's talk a little bit more about the medical stuff. So if we were to use, uh, insured nomads or or some companies uh, expat insurance is that covering like is it just emergency coverage or is it also sort of like routine and preemptive coverage like would that cover uh, going to the dentist twice a year would that cover I don't know getting x-rays or or doctor visits like you just want to get um, a prescription done or, you know, just sort of like more routine doctor stuff. Is that covered under the, the expat health insurance? Yes. Generally speaking, yes. Uh, when, you, when you're purchasing, you usually have an option to include dental. You reference, you know, if you wanted to get your teeth checked. That's usually an option you can add on to it. Dental insurance is never just something that's included with health insurance, but it's something you can often add on. Now, a general checkup, there's often a waiting period because, you know, it's one of those cost containment issues for health insurance companies is, okay, great. You don't just get a policy and go to the doctor and say, okay, can you find anything wrong with me? <laughs> so, okay. That's it's kind of like taking your car to the shop and it's like, I, there's no particular issue. See if you can find something to fix. You know, so... Uh, maternity will have a a 10 month waiting period. And that's again, so that there's not a $30,000 bill that the insurance is having to pay when you haven't made any claim, any payment. So so I guess that would be one reason to, uh, if you're out there listening to this and you've been sort of delaying it, don't wait till two weeks before you start traveling, maybe get it now or get it early such that, uh, you can get the clock ticking towards, uh, what we're talking about here. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things to where you don't want to wait till you've had the policy for 12 months and then at renewal say, Hey, add maternity. We're thinking about having a kid now, or we've wanted to, we just didn't do it when we first got the policy. So for those who are, you know, thinking I may meet somebody and I may decide to start a family, Mm -hmm. go ahead and include maternity on your policy. If you're, if that's an option for you. And what um, is maternity, the by the way? That's like, that's, that's like the, sorry, sorry to cut like you off. It's like paying for the birth of a child. for the birth. And okay. yeah, and all the neo, the newborn care and things like that. And that's cool. Covered. And so that you can basically almost like last minute choose where you want to have the baby as long as, you know, it's, just, it's like yeah, under your As long as it's region. in the regions you've looked. Yeah. So this could, so what we're saying here, I'm just connecting dots, is that this uh, expat health insurance 
could work well with like a birth tourism strategy if there are people out there that maybe want to have one kid in Mexico and one kid in Brazil and so forth. Absolutely. Okay. It's it's often done in in that sense because especially if you're you don't want to go through the birthing process in your home country. So the thing of ah yeah, let's let's go ahead and get there. Uh, this is you know having telemedicine and being able to work with mental health therapists is one of the things that I would look for in your in your health plan because we're so much more um, spiritual and emotional than we are just these physical beings. But yet that's one of the last things we take care of a lot of times is, is our mind. Mm -hmm. And sorry, I was, I, I kind of cut you off a moment ago that you said that there was a big thing that you wanted to get across. Oh, what, what was that big thing though? <laughs> Okay. Um, so, so here's what I'll say, uh, is, um, I'm trying to think of this. I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of a lot of listeners and digital nomads and people thinking about doing this and perhaps they've got their first, uh, either remote job or online income streams, they're freelancing, they're contracting, uh, and maybe they can either forego their health insurance uh, as Americans can, if they're abroad, right? You can forgo your health insurance or, mm -hmm. uh, or they're, you know, maybe they're Canadian or from the UK. They want to switch their tax residency to, um, uh, outside of, of Canada to like a territorial tax country or something. Um, and the only thing you really lose doing that is that quote unquote free healthcare. And then part of their strategy, right? So, you're Canadian, you switch your residency to the Bahamas or Panama or whatever. And then you just need to think about where is my health insurance going to come from then? And how am I going to have health care now that it's not provided for free by Canada? Um, and so I guess that's potentially where insured nomads could come in and, and be not only like the health insurance, but almost like the primary health care plan. Absolutely. You, you hit it spot on. And, but it takes intentionality. It takes planning because, and budgeting because you can get health insurance dirt cheap. I mean, travel insurance, sorry, you get travel insurance so cheap mm -hmm. from so many places because they're betting that you're not going to get sick on your trip. Mm -hmm. uh, and that when you come home to your, your passport country, that you've got something in place. Now, with, with switching over to the health insurance model, you may have to spend you know, 200 500 bucks a month, depending on your age. Like me, I, I feel like I'm in my late 20s, but I'm not. I'm in my late 40s now. And so I'm going to be paying you know, 800 bucks a month for health insurance to live around the world. But the investment in that, the investment while you can with at least a minimal life insurance policy, because you never know in 20 years what you need to leave behind. So go ahead and do that while you're, while you're planning out your budget. Uh, know that's nothing that we provide to our customers, but think in advance about some basic life insurance. Get, leave a power of attorney mm -hmm. with someone that's not in this lifestyle with you so that if you're in, you're in a hospital in a coma somewhere, someone else can help through that process. Um, Go ahead and, and build a will because you don't know how fast your business is going to be growing. And it would just be wise to, to leave a will with someone. Copy of your passport with them. Itinerary with as that changes, update people that aren't traveling with you. I know I deviated from the insurance front, but it's all connected in, mm -hmm. in keeping people in this community safe. Uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why the things we built into our membership product that goes with our insurance it's a 12 month membership that gets you um, an instant response button for crisis, for safety, security. Yeah. It's evacuation even after your insurance is expired because that comes for 12 months. Even in your home country, it'll relocate you if, if there's a natural disaster or, or political unrest, terrorism. And to, to have the cybersecurity, but also to have the physical security components in place 
that's so crucial in this day and age. Yeah, I think those are all important points. Um, I wanted to just sort of double down on my previous question, which was like, is is there a difference between a health insurance and a health plan in your mind? If if, if you know what I'm saying, no. Like, and and if we went British, it would be a health scheme because <laughs> that's just their word for a plan or program or yeah. Okay, so people could think of this as like their primary health plan, not just like emergency health insurance. Correct, unless they're going travel insurance, which is kind of more just a very basic for a short trip or you know backup plan. Okay, yeah, that that sounds great because I think that's uh that's uh, what people need to know is they need that. Um, sense of security from knowing that when they leave their home country that they have um, a strong health insurance plan that can be sort of more proactive and preemptive. And it's not only when something bad happens, but it's actually that ability to visit a doctor every six months or a year and um, uh, be able to, you know, get prescriptions, like I said, and um, and, and things like that. Right. It's, it's that thing of, is it, are you getting something just for the catastrophe or for the annual, you know, every few years you need the, may need a prostate check or, a you know, cancer exam or something. All of us need to be planning. So when you say, is it a plan? Absolutely. It's, you said another key word there being proactive. That's why I, I deviated there for a minute. It's because there's so many elements of this lifestyle that a lot of times we just ignore. Right. And so let me, let me say this. Yeah. So let's say uh, you want to basically be a snowbird in, in Mexico or um, uh, you have a country in mind where you want to live, Mexico, Nicaragua, whatever. And you're looking at maybe the local plans there. I'm, I'm looking at my Mexican private health insurance options and I'm just kind of like, these plans suck. You know what I mean? I I could look for I I could look to instead of choosing the local Mexican plan I could just look at insured nomads to uh, as almost like a direct competitor and be like you know what I'm going to go with one of these expat plans instead of some private health insurance plan in Mexico does that make sense It it totally does and that's what the average person has done for decades now when they've been the country manager of, of a, you know, manufacturing company going to Mexico, they're going to Sigma global. They're going to, you know, Allianz, one of the major giant companies and saying, Hey, help. Can you do it? That was me in Ghana. We paid a thousand dollars a month for our family of four Mm -hmm. for about five years uh, with at the time at the international is who we had. And, uh, they, they serve tens of thousands of, of location-independent expat nomads, you, you name it, whatever the title is around the world, these giant companies do. And, and it's only been as the spotlight has shifted to say, oh, wait, there's more than the international assignee for manufacturers and tech firms. There are these folks who are just working from their laptops themselves. And so a picture was made that, okay, they're on a trip, but many are not tripping unless they're going to ayahuasca. No, many are not (laughs) tripping. They're really living this long-term year after year after year. So they're not on a trip. When we have claims that are in Europe by Europeans, we can have those paid in part by the government. So we get to file it with the government help pay for the Europeans care, even though they may not have been in their home country. There, there are a lot of layers to the questions that were in that set mm-hmm. uh, in that. Are we moving to where they're continental plans? Absolutely not <laughs> because it's a legal contract. Insurance is a legal contract and it's generally administered where it was purchased because that's where the company is based. Now, if the company is willing to have uh, be regulatory compliant in all those places, then yes. 
But things shift. Payment is one of the major solves with making it easy. And that's that's what one of the functions of having our insured nomads MasterCard is so that we can do it quickly. Uh, inside our health app, if your bank account info is there, we can have that payment to you um, instantly, practically. And so there are a lot of things where payment has been hold up. We still, we can't... Mm. If you happen to injure yourself in North Korea, we can't transfer funds to that hospital. So, yeah, there there's some limitations. But no, it's it's going to take at least another generation before insurance catches up to the way we work around the world. Because it is it is one of the most tech-apathetic segments of society because we're dealing with a legal contract. That's why it's that packet in the mail or a PDF attached to an email. Definitely. Um, so you kind of alluded to it there. I was hoping you could walk through what the what the process would look like for someone that, let's just say, we show up at a hospital in Mexico, we have an issue. I don't know. We have malaria or something, right? Are we are we paying out of pocket first? Uh, we you know uh, get the receipt and then we file the receipt with insured nomads. And then you guys pay us out later or, or, or what can you walk us through sort of just like the, 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 the process? Yeah, that's, that's another wild thing. Cause there's so many different types of hospitals in Mexico, so many different cultures within the country. So it's hard to provide a cookie cutter answer because if you're in a remote area and that hospital may or may not treat you without guarantee of payment first. Or in a city, they may not also. So they may want to talk to us and say, okay, can you provide what's called a guarantee of payment? It says, if we start treating this person, will you pay? That's tough because that's an, an open box there. The You're, of course, in touch with us for continuity of care with our claims team. So that if we look at it and say, okay, this was diagnosed, we need to go to a second, get a second opinion. We need to transfer you to a different hospital potentially. So there's no cookie cutter answer to it. But in most cases, the average claim is very small and the hospital wants to get paid before you leave and wires can't take place right then. Mm -hmm. So the easy answer to say is since the claim is going to be small and they want to get paid before you walk away, then that means you'd pay and we reimburse you. Okay. And, um, so that's, that's the simplest explanation because of how claims generally work. The catastrophic, the huge claim is rare. And when that takes place, you, the person has been in the hospital long enough to where a wire can take place, or we can drop the funds on the insured nomads MasterCard, where you pay it, the business office of the, of the hospital when you leave. I see. So I guess generally, uh, small stuff, pay it out, get reimbursed, big stuff, you guys will step in. Absolutely. Uh, and that'll shift with, that's one of the things we believe will shift with time as to where even the small things are taken care of instantly with, as we deploy the our MasterCard in more uses. But this is new. Most companies don't have access to this technology and we're pushing the limits on it. Okay. It must be, it must be wild in your, um, uh, what would you call it? Like your, your claims center or whoever your like customer service people, like just running like an international claims business. And it's like, it's like, what? This guy was like skiing in Patagonia. This other guy's, I don't know, in the deserts of Algeria, this other guy's like in the, the jungles of Samoa who, and it's just like, you must, you guys must just hear like the craziest stories all the time. Yeah, it does uh, provide a lot of, of fun sharing as, as we it's like, Oh man, this person is chatting before they move to here or before they start their journey. And, and others, as they tell us, it's, it's, it's really fun because the relationships we have going with, with our members, it's not just a transaction. It's it's often conversation saying, hey, you know, just left this airport lounge, snapped a picture, tagged you guys. This was so great. You know, that kind of thing. So it's 
It is. But as our team is very multinational, very diverse, it just reinforces that also. Nice. And is it like 24 hours you can get someone on the line? It For emergency response, yes. For generic questions of, hey, does your, your policy cover skydiving? That one, we do have some gaps in our chat and phone and things. Yeah, that's understandable. But generally, it, it is it depends on the time of day. But is um, uh, I would say about 20 out of 24 hours, we've got somebody ready to chat and answer questions on our website. And that comes in through Instagram, Telegram, uh, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, etc. So you can message us in, in the means that you like to message in. Are, are there any countries that you guys just flat out do not provide service in or will not reimburse claims for? Yes. Uh, sadly, yes. And those are North Korea, Syria, um, Yemen, countries that are usually on, on watch lists from governments because we can't transfer money into those countries. And um, Russia, sadly, is on that list because of the war mm-hmm. uh, there's it's just makes it really hard to make payments but for those who are going into Ukraine uh, as they rebuild in this next generation we need a lot of digital nomads going into Ukraine saying hey I'm willing to work from there so we're we're working to build out a policy that will cover you even if you're in the war zone are there other countries where they're not sanctioned but they're just like hard to send money to um maybe like vanuatu or i don't know myanmar or something like what what about those those far-flung countries no they're really banking is has moved forward enough where hospitals have the means to receive funds hospitals and clinics have have dealt with foreign foreign patients enough they have mechanisms in place Okay, cool. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we, I, I guess we didn't fully get into a discussion about like all the different types of nomads, but I guess the the general idea is that you could get worldwide and it's going to be a little bit more expensive, or you could get like sort of country or continent specific, and that'll hopefully bring down the cost. Yeah. And, and, you know, the resources that from the people that you have on your podcast, that is, you know, that Latin life, you get bring in great guests. So folks tune in and listen here because listening through other people's experiences, learning through the stories they share, this is a great resource that's been built up here at that Latin life. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, I did uh, want to just double down about the uh, single versus family thing a little bit. I think um, uh, our core audience is people who are probably like just about to have families like late 20s, or they have a very young family that's starting to grow. Um, And so just wanted to hear from you, you know, what people should be thinking about from a health insurance perspective. Uh, as they want to uh, have a digital nomad lifestyle or an international lifestyle while having kids, because I think that's one of the one of the big considerations to being like an international family. It's schooling, uh, as we talked about in in the opening minutes of this episode, but then it's also healthcare. Yes, with a family, I would make no sac- take no sacrifice there, and I would invest in health insurance. Because you're responsible for that kid. And as in those early years, diagnoses can happen. And in the birth, it's uh, you know my wife and our chief medical officer, Juliana, originally was a pediatrician. There's so many wonderful, easy births with no complications. Then there are others where you want to have health insurance there. You want to be able to go to the best facilities to have the follow-up appointments without thinking, no, we can't afford that this month or the specialist that might be needed. You, Whether it's speech therapy, you name it, you want to have insurance so that you can give your best to, to your partner, to your kid. It's just one of those 
simple essentials of life, I believe. Yeah, definitely. Um, what are some of the big questions that people should be asking themselves or that I guess they might see on the questionnaire uh, when it comes to filling out their insurance? Let's see. Some of those questions are about things that have happened in diagnosis that you may have had. So it's going to ask the hospital that or the doctor that diagnosed it, the date, and what the treatment was, the current status of that diagnosis. So you may have to do a little bit of digging to figure out what those dates were, what if that doctor's still there. Because our medical review team, or if you're going with one of the one of the other folks in the space, the medical review team is going to want to know the answers. So you may have to find phone numbers and email addresses of those uh, practitioners that you went to in the past. Mm -hmm. If you've never had any issues, no health issues, then it's a cakewalk. You're just marking no to every question and hit submit and you'll have an answer in no time. Okay. So there's no, no question or, or frustration if it's all a quick, easy no. Is it, is it, I know this, uh, this depends wildly, but just so someone could can uh, listen and hear without filling out the questionnaire, like how much roughly on average would it cost a single person to get healthcare coverage and for, let's say, a family of four to get healthcare coverage? So, yeah, a lot of variances of age is one of the pricing factors and where you want to be. Mm -hmm. So the broader that is, the more expensive the policy will be. The older you are, the more expensive. The And those gen, prices are generally on five-year age bands in the industry. Mm -hmm. So you may be getting the policy at 34 years old, but next year it's going to go up. Not because you use the policy at all, but you just hit a new age band mm. between 35 and 39. And... Same way as, you know, after you've had these policies a few years, they're going to go up because of medical um, inflation, cost of care around the world going up, along with medical technologies costing more. So not just inflation around the world, but what's called medical inflation also. So for basic health insurance, say you're choosing South America only or Canada and South America, yep. you may be paying at 28 years old, you may pay th 350 bucks a month for health insurance. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to include the US in there at 28 years old, you might jump up an extra 150 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. But that could be vital for you because you may be working with American clients and you or go to conferences and go see friends and family and end up spending three months out of the year in the US. That is nothing compared to the cost of a hospital visit in the States just for, for something sure. simple like a, a sprained ankle where they're going to say, oh, yeah, you should elevate it for the next three weeks. But they'll charge you 6000 bucks to tell you yep. you should elevate your foot. Yeah. Do you find that companies that have remote workers um, are often like covering this for their for their employees? And I guess a related question, how much of your business is like individuals versus your approaching companies and getting like company deals done? Yeah, about 80% of our, our business is through companies and multinational organizations that have people mm -hmm. spread around the world. Okay. And that other 20, 25% is, is the independent worker saying, hey, look. Um, I need this for my lifestyle. I take responsibility for my health. So I'm going to do this now having, having it included, that's a lot in your prop in the potential employees proposition too. saying, look, I'll take this job, but I want a global health insurance plan. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's like, okay, we'll do it. We pay through remote or deal and we'll give you a, a card and you can put your health insurance on your card. You choose the plan. Then you can go wherever you want, get the plan. 
So we're finding it oftentimes where the companies are saying, you know, it's your choice where you get it. If it's a more freelance remote worker that is contract based versus salaried. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very smart. Uh, yeah, I think this is a, a, a really important product and company that you guys have built. This is something that definitely needed to exist. Um, want to be respectful of your time so we can get to wrapping up a little bit, Andrew. Uh, do you have any final um, messages that you would like to share with the audience, be it advice or just letting people know how they can get in touch with you and give them a little call to action? Well, thank you so much for for everyone for tuning in, listening, and and sharing this podcast and the links that you see for it, so that other people can can join in and listen, learn, contribute, uh, comment when you see this link on social media. And on the piece of advice I would give, as I referenced earlier, I've had my share of health. Uh, challenges over the years, whether it was living in, in West Africa and having malaria over and over, or as I referenced, heart attack and bypass surgery and raising kids in this cross-border lifestyle, seeing the things they've faced at different times. I encourage you all just to take your time. Life is too unpredictable and hurry is your enemy. So plan well and be willing to slowly adjust and not just quick, make quick reactions and say, okay, tired of it here. We're booking a flight tomorrow. You're probably paying a lot extra to book that flight, flight tomorrow and book it in for a week later, a month later, six months later, just because you think, okay, I can grow if I stick it out in this one location or if I'm not making a decision because I'm in a hurry. It's kind of my biggest encouragement for, for all of you is slow down, be intentional, do the research, care for yourself, and realize that hurry potentially is your enemy. Join me on social media, Andrew Jernigan, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, etc. And go to Insured Nomads, chat with somebody there and um, or message us at members at insurednomads.com or through WhatsApp, et cetera, at, on our contact page at insurednomads.com. And we're here for you. We exist to make products that make your life better. Thanks for joining us today. And, and Vance and that no Latin life, well done again. Thank you. Uh, this has been another episode of the My Latin Life podcast with Andrew Jernigan, CEO of InsuredNomads.com. Again, be, be sure to go check out InsuredNomads.com, at InsuredNomads on Twitter, other social media platforms. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thank you.